Hey there, Sudbury. Welcome to CKLU 96.7. You are tuned in for another hour of Crater Conversations. Uh, this is your host, Jess, from ourcrater.com. Uh, you can check right to the site there online. Check out on the old interwebs uh, for all sorts of updates on things that are going on in the city, people you should know about, businesses you should know about, uh, things happening in our city. Uh, so basically... All those people that say there's nothing going on in Sudbury, we want to just throw that in their face. Take a look at it. See what you can find. So we got, uh, this week we have a very special guest. His name is Matt Haiti. Uh, so he is, works closely with uh, Lisa O'Connell, who we interviewed last week for Pat the Dog. Uh, and they have Place Melter coming up very soon at the end of the month, a uh, full week of new northern northern play work so it's uh really exciting stuff to see so they're gonna have all sorts of different different works in different stages starting from script readings all the way to basically a fully cooked piece um so it's going to be really exciting throughout the week and kind of really see the process that a piece of theater usually will go through before you finally as an audience are able to see it and you're also going to kind of get an opportunity to give really invaluable input into the works that are still in progress and uh, let them know what's working what's not working and uh, what directions they need to go in so that's really exciting stuff that you can check out very soon it'll be at a Sudbury theater center they're taking over the whole space and uh, so that's really that's something that we're really excited about. And uh, if you listened to last week, you got all sorts of detail, details about that. And we'll be talking really briefly about that with, about with Matt later on. But the main project we have him here for today is for Project Bookmark Canada. Uh, Matt Haiti's book, City Still Breathing, is going to be receiving a plaque. Uh, so basically, Project Bookmark Canada is installing uh, plaques to in locations in which there is a tie to some sort of a piece of literature. And so the one that will be installed on May 3rd at the Townhouse Tavern from Matt Haiti's book, City Still Breathing, uh, which is featured, it's uh, called actually the Nickel Bin in this book, but is featured based on the Townhouse uh, heavily. So they'll be receiving a plaque on the 3rd, uh, and it's actually going to be the 20th pa- plaque and the most northern, pl- the first northern plaque. So it's really exciting. Uh, you can check that out on May, th- May 3rd. Um, so Matt Haiti, it was really great talking to him, and uh, I'm going to call myself out here. Through this whole interview, I am going to call Matt Matt Heidi, Heidi instead of Haiti. And I really think that speaks to the character of our particular interviewer today, our interviewee today, I should say. Um, he sat there and grinned and bared and did not correct me even once, even when I asked him if I was saying it incorrectly. He corrected me, and then I proceeded to continue to say it incorrectly. So um, just the, the g- most genuinely nice guy and uh, very, very humble. Uh, we're really proud of his work, but... Uh, and, you know, like, I'm excited to, to for this project bookmark, but he really maintains that it's not his work. He's just representing the Northern work. So very humble guy, really great guy, but, you know, can't fool us. We still think you're great. So we're going to hear this interview with Matt. We're going to hear all about City Still Breathing, uh, the plaque that's going to be be, uh, be installed, and um, wo- more about uh, what we can expect coming up. This week on Creator Conversations, we have on the show Matt Heidi. We're going to talk about a few exciting projects that he has coming up. Um, the first one we want to talk about is um, a pro- can- Canadian literary bookmark that is going to be installed at the Townhouse Tavern uh, in honor of Matt's book, uh, City Still Breathing. So first, can you to kind of start the whole thing off? Let's Tell us about the book. Tell us where you got the idea from and the kind of the storyline. Oh, God. Okay. Um... <clears throat> Well, I think I, I started it actually when I was living in Fredericton. Um, so I'd gone out east to study um, to get my MA, and so the first chapter, um, which actually ended up being in the middle of the book, started there, just thinking about home. And I think that was really important for me to get the idea out, being away from home. I don't know if you've ever lived away from your home mm-hmm. for a long period of time, but it kind of gives you a different perspective of the place that you live. Okay. So in some ways. It's nostalgic, it's romantic, it, it's not the place it actually is, but in other ways it gives you sort of a stark reality of what's really important to you about that place. So I think it was important for me to start elsewhere, but then I, I didn't touch it again. I wrote that one chapter, and I think I, I wrote some other ideas, but I never thought of it as a book. It was just a story I'd written 
And it's only when I moved back to Sudbury that I started looking at these little fragments that I had that I kind of thought, I think there might be a book in here. But it wasn't really a traditional book because um, the, the chapters the chapters are connected by this body that's discovered on the side of the road. So the book starts with the body being found out so on... quite mysterious. <laughs> Grizzly, yeah, a little mysterious. This body being found frozen uh, on the side of the road by these two guys driving by, by in, a, in a police van. And so they, they pick up the body and they bring it back to Sudbury. And somewhere along the way, the body disappears from the back of that van. And it starts appearing to all these other uh, different characters in the book that ex- experience the body in, in a different way. And so the chapters are linked. It's all set during the same night. Um, characters that are kind of uh, prominent in one chapter are seen walking in the background in another chapter. And so if you're paying really close attention, it happens in the same timeline. Um, and they all eventually link up in the, in the final chapters of the book. But it allowed me to sort of write independent chapters, uh, almost as sort of capsule short stories. So okay. it was a chance for me to sort of get to um, focus on my own craft. It was my first long-form novel and, and get a little better at writing um, and also sort of publish the chapters independently so I could um, experience a bit of the publishing world and gain a little bit of steam when I put the thing together as a manuscript and sent it away to get published. So it really started, I guess, as sort of a meditation on, on home and what Sudbury meant to be meant to me. And then as moving back home in 2010, it, was, it took me the latter part of a year to finish it, and it continued to be sort of an exploration of what it meant to be coming home and living here while thinking about the past, because it's set in the 80s, so it was really set in a time of my younger childhood in Sudbury. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so obviously a lot of... Uh real people that you know from around Sudbury and a lot of locations from the area are featured. Um, So how does that kind of translate, like people that you know in real life and then kind of turning them into characters that illustrate the whole whole book? Well, I'm really interested in myth. And a lot of the work I've been doing in the theatre community, too, has involved local myths and... uh, and when I think of a, of a myth, it's sort of roots that reach deeply that connect all of us to a particular story or a place. So I never wanted to represent uh, real people in the book, but stories that people shared with me about their experiences in Sudbury and certain aspects of certain characters that we all know in town sort of popped up in here and there. And one of the big ones, of course, that um, people of my generation or older would recognize would be Dino the Popcorn Guy. And we're sitting here right now, and you can see sort of the corner where Thrive is across the street. That would be the corner where Dino would park his popcorn cart outside the, the newspaper stand, and he would sell it there every day. And for a lot of people, he was kind of like a clock, which you could measure the day by based on where he'd be. And sort of that person in the background, even if you didn't buy popcorn, that acted as sort of a constant in your life. But at one point, you came downtown and he wasn't there anymore. And probably nobody remembers that day because it just was another day. And then he wasn't there the day after that. And sooner or later, it just became a part of your life that wasn't constant anymore. And so he pops up in the book, but is just that idea of that character is a character called Normando that has a very different story that has nothing to do with Dino, but there's that aspect of that person in there. So I think there are some characters that have those aspects to them of people that we might know. Um, but yeah, it was never the intent to sort of be biography or documentary. Even a lot of the businesses, like the townhouse is a prominent sort of part of the novel, but I call it the nickel bin because that is another form of the townhouse, right? So there are some businesses that pop up there as their actual names or some that don't, but I wanted to create sort of a slanted version of the city, not a not an authentic version. Mm-hmm. So the this, this city still breathing, the title of itself really kind of evokes like a, something of a visual. Mm. Um, so can you kind of explain where the, the idea of the just the title and like where it connects to the story? Yeah, it's a funny story actually because it still, when, when I hear the title spoken, it doesn't feel right because the book was always called Another Hard Winter. And um, there was a line from a, a Kevin Quain song and I, I love that title because it gave the impression of a cycle, that it's just another hard winter coming, that we all know sort of the grim reality of what that's going to represent, but we also know we're going to get through it because mm-hmm. we've been through it before. But um, my editor, when we were, when it was accepted for publication, said, 
Uh, and probably quite rightly, that's a really boring title. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear about another something, right? Something that's happened. Like, I don't need to read this because it's already happened. No one likes winter, and especially a hard winter. Yeah. So The City Still Breathing was uh, became the title of the book after much sort of thinking about that. And I love um, the words because they're not mine. It's, it's sort of cribbed from a Weaker Than song, uh, which is a song all about Winnipeg about the city and it's not quite in that phrasing and they've cribbed that song lyric from a uh, Winnipeg poet a poem and so it's it's again sort of reverberations of myth and that's why it really interested me uh, that it says the city still breathing is the idea that it's still going but it's it's dying it's it's coughing we don't know if it's going to be here tomorrow but today it's still here there's still potential for us to get it right and that that's why I like that sense to it um, yeah yeah so then speaking of like kind of this nostalgic kind of away from home kind of feeling then does the kind of the title sort of translate to your feelings as a young adult trying to kind of make your career in your hometown that like you know like like the city's got to have a little life left for me you know <laughs> like yeah it's interesting I heard somebody not that anybody talks about the book at all but somebody recently said um uh, relayed a comment that somebody had said about the book saying like, oh, you must really hate Sudbury having read it because they had seen a really grim depiction of the town and I thought that was so strange because I love it here and and part of my struggle has been um, over my lifetime is sort of been able, living other places, living in Toronto, living in Fredericton, traveling out west um, was to try to find the language for what it is I love about the place and try to put my finger on it and I still don't know I still don't know what it is that ties me here, except that it's something deeper than um, just a feeling. It's something more primal than that, that I just feel like this is the right place. Um, and this is where I want to stage my personal battles and wars and, and fight for things that I care about. But it's not any one thing. Um, so I found that interesting, that, that perhaps there's that depiction in it, but it comes from a childhood of growing up in a slightly different era, I'm not sure if you can relate to this growing up on Manitoulin at all, but um, there's a sort of cliched version of Sudbury that's sort of acid wash and sort of rough and tumble, we like our country music and we play hockey and people work in the mines. And that's not really the cliche that's true. I mean, there are people like that. There's that part of us that has a big nickel that is like that. Um, but then but the feeling like you don't fit into that stereotype of which, so then where do you fit in? Well, sure. Yeah. And also, I think just like growing up in the 80s of having an era where our parents weren't able to call us on our cell phones and uh, where our parents weren't necessarily afraid of danger around the corner. So we were kind of unleashed onto our neighborhoods in the mornings and told to come back, you know, at night. It was always it was almost this kind of idyllic time that existed before us of like, you know, you come home at dark. But, and yet, there was sort of the creeping fear that was coming in of, um, perverts in trench coats and drug dealers in white vans and to think these sort of ever-present danger around you and so those two sides being pinned in between those two things was a really interesting time to grow up of like boundless childhood and the fear of the unknown that was coming and and that's I think what really interested me about the novel even though it's pretty much an adult world there's two children in the book that are kind of at the center of it because their viewpoint was me growing up mm -hmm. here yeah so you say like these particular children are kind of like your viewpoint as a youth. Are there any particular characters in the book that you feel like you kind of represent you and your your experiences? All to an extent. Like and I think probably most writers would tell you that as any creator you any character you create, you kind of flake parts of your personality off and put it in there. Because how could you see things authentically from their point of view if they weren't feelings that you can empathize with? So you know, from Martha the hairdresser at, at Mario's Barbershop to Gordon the hockey and mute hockey enforcer, I empathize with all the characters to some degree. They're all aspects and ways I feel about this place um, in their voices. Mm -hmm. So now we've got the Project Canada, our uh, Project Bookmark Canada plaque being installed at the townhouse very soon, which was featured as the nickel bin in City Still Breathing. Um, so can you tell us more about the Bookmark Canada project? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I can't tell you the whole history of the project, except that 
And the very first um, bookmark was Michael Ondaatje. Um, it was a bookmark for the skin of a lion and uh, featured the Bleur Street Viaduct in Toronto, which is that huge, you know, gorgeous bridge that spans the Don Valley Parkway on Bleur, mm-hmm. um, between Bleur and the Danforth. And uh, now, that's probably the most famous example because he really is the biggest writer associated with the project, but it's spun off from that now, and now there are communities all across Canada, some really well-known books connected to communities, and then some communities that have existed sort of off the literary map, maybe Sudbury, for example, that you know isn't really nationally recognized maybe as having a really strong literary community, even though we do. So there are plenty of representations of these smaller communities with books that speak specifically of that community on sort of a national scale. And, and I think that's been a really beautiful part of the project is it's, it's given attention not just to writers and the works, but also the communities behind them that have created those writers and the works. Mm-hmm. How did City Still Breathing end up being, I guess, nominated to receive a plaque? It was all the work of Kim Farm. I, th- I mean, there's been a lot of people that have worked towards getting um, the funding for this now and making it a reality, but it was an idea that Kim had while she was poet laureate here, and, and Kim is, is, is one of the most central, um, passionate, uh, creative forces in the uh, artistic community here, especially on the literary side. And when she was poet laureate, she um, had tons of initiatives. You can see examples of them if you look out the window at the, the um, uh, Poetry on the Street project where the, the poetry up in the windows here. And all of the sort of uh, initiatives that she started while she was poet laureate were all connected to community and sort of her exploration of space and, and giving some um, help to other voices in the community. So at some point she was in, she could tell the story better than I could, but at some point she was in a writer's retreat out west and she was there with Lawrence Hill, um, writer of Book of Negroes as well as many other amazing books, and his wife Miranda Hill at the time ran Project Bookmark, and so they got into a discussion about it, and um, and so Kim became an advocate for Sudbury getting on that uh, map. And, and a number of works uh, were gathered and considered, City Still Breathing being one of them, and, and uh, luckily the book was the piece that they decided to go uh, forth with, specifically the quote that sort of centers on that one part of town, because that's sort of at the heart of it, is that the quote that's chosen honors the site that the plaque will be attached to or will be lodged in. Okay, so, yeah. so what is the quote? I can't give it to you off the top of my head. It's too long. <laughs> well, it's um, it's a quote that focuses very much on that corner. It's about a character stepping through the door of the townhouse in the morning and seeing the bud car leaving the station, which is something that is really personal to me because um, my mother's family is from Shaplo, which is on the White River line, and so every summer we would ride the bud car up there, and it was just this early morning ritual of showing up and the chuffing of this car leaving the station and Sudbury sort of receding into the distance as you drive through it. And the townhouse, so that being my really sort of youngest experience of leaving town, and then the townhouse, which was also sort of this anchor for no matter where I went, whenever I came home, there was a place that I could meet um, my friends and my community, which has always been the townhouse. It's been this sort of common meeting place for people across social, economic, age, classes, it didn't matter who you were, where you were from, you could meet there and share a drink and some music and all be friends by the end of the night. And so these two parts of my life represent on this one corner really clearly. Um, and also because I geek out about history and the bud car in Sudbury is the last bud car in North America. I don't know if anybody really knows that, but there was another bud car in Victoria on the island that was shut down years ago. So if you want to see a bud car, Sudbury's the place to come and train watch. Wow, who would have known? Uh, only weird geeks like me that, <laughs> that care about these kind of things. <laughs> just you. Yeah, wow. so the quote focuses on just that, uh, a character stepping out of the town experiencing that sort of moment in the early mornings. Great, wow. Um, so now that plaque will be being installed May 3rd, correct? Um, so, <clears throat> and there will be a whole reception for the ordeal, right? Yeah, there's, um, it's a... Uh, Four o'clock at the townhouse, there's, we're going to do a short reading from the book, and then I'm sure there's going to be some speeches from uh, Laurie at, at, at Project Bookmark, and um, 
and uh, reading from the book sort of honored that moment. I'm not sure actually what else is going on. I think there's going to be music. I'm, I've been in the dark about it. You know. Wow. Well, you know, you're the you're the guest of honor, I guess. No. See that, <laughs> well, this is actually one thing that uh, really concerned me about the whole process, and it's it's hard to speak about it without sounding. Um, uh, ungrateful, but I, I had concerns from the very beginning because part of doing work, and I'm not sure if this is how you feel about your own work, is interviewing people and putting focus on other people, is that the reason why you create is to put focus on the thing. Mm-hmm. Right? And and a lot of the work that I've been doing since moving home has been to fight for community. Um, to, to fight uh, for places for other artists to raise their voices here too, and it's and it's a selfish fight because uh, by fighting to put Sudbury on the map or by fighting for space for artists in our city, I'm also speaking for my own needs as well. Mm-hmm. But what's awkward about a thing like this for me then is that I don't really want to be the focus of of anything. I like the work is important to discuss, and so the only way I can kind of think about this or frame it. Is this, this is an acknowledgement of the work of the literary community here and the work of many of us that are doing this thing and fighting this battle. And so I'm just chosen to represent that. And the book is just chosen to represent the community at large. And for that, I think I'm really, I'm really proud to have that position. But it's not just me. All right, so we're going to cut to some music here. We're going to be back with Matt shortly uh, to discuss some other projects he's been working on. Um, but we'll be back in just a moment. Hey, welcome back to CKLU. Uh, if you've been listening in for since the top of the hour, we've been talking uh, with Matt Haiti, even though I pronounce it wrong through the whole interview. So count how many times I say it wrong. It'll be a fun game. Uh, so uh, we're talking this hour with Matt Haiti. Uh, you can check his out the reception for his uh, for the B- Project Canada bookmark. Uh, whoa, bookmark. Project Bookmark Canada. It's such a tongue twister. I, I can, I'll can i never be able to say it right. It's on May 3rd at the townhouse. They'll be installing a plaque uh, honoring Matt Hades' book, um, City Still Breathing, uh, with a specific quote that he just talked about a moment ago. Um, so we hope to see you out there. Uh, so a few other things coming up, actually, on the same day, on May 3rd. You can check out, uh, actually, CKLU is presenting a concert also at the the townhouse tavern there's going to be fortune killers natalie lynn and venus fur so you definitely want to check that out uh the tickets are on sale right now so you can buy them in advance uh they're seven dollars so you really have no excuses um there's also and also another concert that i'm excited to check out myself uh coming up at the townhouse at the end of september the great lake swimmers they're coming on september 29th so we're going to do a song from both of those artists we've got um I must have I must have someone else's blues by Great Blake Swimmers and Lion by Fortune Killer. So we'll be back in just a moment after the, that. Thanks for tuning in to Creator Conversations presented by Our Creator. We can't play the music right here, but check out below for the link to this week's playlist, as well as all the links you need for this week's guest. Make sure you're subscribed to Our Creator on all your feeds. Look us up on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under Our Creator, and use the hashtag Our Creator to be featured. Hey, welcome back to CKLU. We are just in, getting into our second half of this edition of Creator Conversations. I'm again your host, Jess. Uh, this host we have been talking, er, this week we have been talking with our uh, guest, Matt Haiti. Uh, he is presenting, uh, a, he is being presented with actually a Project Bookmark Canada plaque that's going to be installed at the Townhouse Tavern. Speaking of the Townhouse Tavern, if you liked what you just heard, you can catch both of those acts performing their very soon. Uh, so our first song we had up there was I Must Have Someone Else's Blues by the Great Lake Swimmers. They're going to be performing at the Townhouse on September 29th. Uh, second one we had there was Lion from Fortune Killers. And CKLU will be presenting uh, them with, along with Natalie Lynn and Venus Furs coming up on May 3rd. So actually the same day as Matt Hades' uh, plaque 
unveiling. So uh, make a day of it. Spend spend the day at the townhouse. Why not, right? Um, so uh, we're going to get into our second half of our interview. We're going to talk some some of the other projects that Matt's involved in. Uh, one that I was really excited to talk to him about is the Ground Up project that he's involved in. Uh, he's one of a team of three. He's particularly responsible for writing the book for an all original musical production that Yes Theatre is putting together in time for their 10th anniversary season in 2019. So uh, it's very early days for that project, but uh, we got we got in, what information we could out of him. Um, so uh, listen in. We're going to talk with him more about some of his other projects. Of course, we'll also get his creator conversations questions as well and a few of his song recommendations. Welcome back to our second half of Creator Conversations. Uh, this episode we've had on the show Matt Heidi. Uh, he's been talking to us in our first half about a really exciting... Bro- Project oh Bookmark God. Canada. Project Bookmark. <laughs> wow, I can't get my words right. A Project Bookmark Canada. Like okay. um, <clears throat> plaque that will be installed at the townhouse uh, very shortly uh, for his book, City Still Breathing. Um, but lots of other projects you've been working on. So um, I know you are definitely heavily involved in Pat the Dog which we talked with Lisa O'Connell last week but um, can you maybe give us just a highlight of a few of the things that you're looking forward to yourself uh, for Place Culture this year? Right. Um, The rest afterwards is always the part that I look forward to. No, I'm just kidding. It's going to be like a week straight of electrifying things that are all going to be exciting. Uh, Perhaps though if I could highlight what I'm most excited about at Selfish is that we're bringing Eric Rose, who's one of the most exciting artists, I think, working in Canada today. Um, he's the artistic director of Ghost River Theatre, but selfishly, he's also an old high school friend of mine who went to Sudbury Secondary uh, and left for Toronto and then ended up moving to make his career in Calgary. And so we're bringing him back for the first time in like 15 years, and he's exploring a play called Struck, so being sort of beginning um, exploration of this piece. Uh, and it's about literally being struck by lightning, um, documenting sort of a true experience that happened to Eric when he was here as a, as a young man, that him and, and, and my brother and some other friends had this experience together down on Long Lake. And so he's exploring that in theatrical terms. And so selfishly, I find that very exciting because it's, it's kind of a kind of a good story for us because Place Melter is going into its sixth year and one of the focuses has been on local artists and local community and telling our stories and uh, and this is kind of bringing it full circle we're now bringing home an artist who started here who has made himself you know a world-class artist and he's coming here to both work on his own stuff but also work with our artists in this devised intensive, so it's a specific sort of kind of theatre called devised work, and it's a tool that we don't normally get to see here, and so he's doing a week of intense training, four days, with, uh, with a bunch of our emerging artists. So I'm really excited about that part. But Paradise, which is Guandoc Theatre from the Yukon, is bringing the main stage piece, and that's going to be awesome. And uh, Miriam Cousin is working on a translation of Parmi Les Eclats, which was just at the Tiano earlier this year. And so we're going to get to see a fresh translation of that, which is exciting. And Yes Theatre, it's a chance for us to collaborate with them on workshopping a new musical based on the short story Yellow Wallpaper. So those are kind of sort of the big ones. I'm giving you the whole spiel. You said, can you name one thing? I'm like, I can't name one thing. I want all the candy in the I'm store. I'm just too excited. Yeah. And then we're also working on three new scripts by local writers, Adric Clough, Rick Duffy, and, Lair- and um, Kim Fawner. So three mm-hmm. of my favorite uh, local playwrights were workshopping their pieces too. Yeah. So you have don't have any shows in this year's uh, round of Place Melter, but you have in the past. So can you mm-hmm. tell us about um, some of the work that you've presented before? Yeah. I, I mean... There's not usually space or room because we're always running, Lisa and I and and Nicole and the other staff that run the festival, we're always running around like crazy. So there's not really time to be selfish and sort of take some space for your own work in there, nor should there be really. But last year we presented Receiver of Wreck, which was a piece that I've been working on for a number of years. And that was really exciting for me to have a chance to participate in the festival as an artist and not a producer, which normally um, takes up all of our time. Um, so that was that was one chance, but I'd say you know the, the the exciting thing about the festival for me is getting a chance to present others' work and and show people some of the things that really excite me and excite us as a company. Yeah. 
So in your theater work, you will often work with uh, Crestfallen, um, presenting all sorts of different productions. And one of the things that you really like to do is weird places, right? right. So can you tell us a little more about uh, things that you guys might have coming up or some of the projects yeah. you've done in the past? So one of the things I'm really concerned about as we've been talking here, you probably noticed I'm concerned about a lot of things. One of the things that I find really fascinating is how we treat space. And in my lifetime, I've seen a lot of beautiful buildings come down in the downtown or just sitting there, either as vacant parking lots or a beautiful building that's just sort of sprayed over with stucco. Uh, it's just the natural life cycle of a city that things come and go. But I think one of the things we've done really badly here is treat our history with a sense of, uh, of shame, that it's better to tear old things down and build something fancy and new and shiny than it is to figure out how to make that old thing work, um, how, to, how to reintegrate that old thing back into the fabric of downtown. So that naturally kind of grew into um, a kind of theater that's called site, site work, which uses non-traditional theater spaces and puts audiences into non-traditional configurations with, with pieces. So a traditional experience would be you go to the theater, you sit down in your seat, the play happens, you watch it, you go home. Maybe you talk to people about it, maybe you don't, maybe you liked it, maybe you didn't. It's a very passive experience. And as we were talking earlier, I think a phenomenally uncool one as we move on, that that, that sort of level of engagement um, only satisfies one part of you. Maybe, and, and, and there's still room for that. But I think in order to make live performances something that remains relevant, we have to explore new ways to engage with people. So the way that I'm choosing to fight that battle is let's get people into spaces they haven't really seen very often and have them look at it in new ways and have them engage with a performance in a way that isn't quite so passive that kind of asks them to, to, what do you want out of this experience? How do you want to watch it? Where do you want to sit? Do you want to touch the performers? Um, do you want to touch the set? It, it puts us in contact in a more vital way that I think can help those other, other systems or other experiences. I think doing this kind of theater isn't the only kind of theater, but it helps next time you go back and you sit in a traditional sort of experience to kind of know this is what I want it to mean to me, you know. So, for example, our last piece um, was on the top floor of the Corny's building, the Silverman's building, and it was really exciting for us. John Corny sort of opened up that building to us. We had the free run of this empty space, and we turned it, we animated it, and turned it back into an old department store. And our next piece, which we're exploring right now, we don't know where it's going to be. Because all not of the, yet. Not yet. I mean, we're looking out at it downtown right now, and part of the problem with these kind of performances in sight are that we need access to a building to do it. And people want to rent em empty spaces, obviously, um, to permanent businesses, and we're looking at renting them on short term. So right now, we're, we're sort of we're, we're casting the net wide and trying to find seldom seen or threatened sites downtown landlords and business owners who would be willing to sort of open up their space for a month to a bunch of quirky artists who want to kind of take it over and do something really cool with it. And what's good about that is it oftentimes brings attention to a space that people haven't thought of or seen in that way before. And, and sometimes it, that space ends up being rented after we leave it, you know, because somebody's seen it and they're like, that's really cool. That's, I, you know, I've never seen this place before. We should maybe rent it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so just wheel and deals. Yeah. Realtors and theater makers. Yeah. I, we, we, have you watched? Um, oh, was it Santa Clarita Diet? No, I haven't oh, watched that. They call themselves real realtors. They added like an extra syllable in it, and they'd be really particular about it. Like we're realtors. Wow, real. I don't know why that made me think of that, but it did. <laughs> I like it. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> So a project that you're going to be working on that's coming up that's really exciting is the Ground Up project with Yes Theatre. Mm. Um, so that's in the very, very, very early stages right now. Um, but can you tell us about the Ground Up project and what exactly it's going to accomplish in the end? Wow. Um, that is maybe a loaded question. <laughs> the, I will say, From the Ground Up is an initiative that Alessandro started with Yes Theatre when the idea was to start commissioning local work you know, which is, I totally applaud that because that's a battle that we've been fighting with um, STC and Place Smelter for years is trying to find spaces for local voices. But an original suburb, suburb musical has never been done, as far as I know, 
uh, on that scale. So um, he's found the funding to commission uh, three writers, so I'm part of that team. I'm, I'm working on the book, which if you're not familiar with musicals is sort of the boring part. The book is the stuff that's not sung or danced or played, and so it's often not the part that people remember about musicals necessarily. But that's my, my realm as I'm working on the book. And then Landon and Richard are the two other gents involved in the process, and they're working on the music and lyrics uh, of the piece. So it's a team of three of us supported by, you know, Ali and the entire sort of Yes Theatre uh, collective. And it's, it's going to be really exciting, but again, it's early stages. So what we know about it so far is that it's, it's set here, and one of our main talking points is uh, trying to figure out what it is that keeps people in a place like this, and maybe some of the reasons that people leave a place like this, and also why people come back. I don't know about you, but I have like a lot of friends that like leaving high school. Like I can't wait to get out of this place, getting out of this town, you know. And then a lot of people that didn't leave, and then people that come back and say like, you know, I went away, and it's only when I left that I really realized how much I loved it here. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's what we're really interested in talking about is sort of what ties you to a place. And um, and we're just doing research. Mm-hmm. We spent a week last month talking to people and having conversations. We met groups of teens in coffee shops. We went and talked to um, senior artist members of the community and, uh, and we had some really good conversations and now we're still going to continue that process before we actually start to put things down. And Richard and Landon wrote an awesome song. They wrote this great song It's like, that could be the starting number of the musical. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, inspiration's already coming coming by here. Yeah. Um, wow. So, what, so, doing research, like, what kind of people are you looking to connect with doing research for for the show? Really anybody. I mean, we would just talk to a lot of people. Um, we cast the net wide and talk to a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different ages. I think there will always be the interest in sort of younger people, but we've all been young once. Some people like me never grew up, right? So, um, really anybody is relevant to speak to during the process and I, I think next phase that we have we're going to continue the conversations um, dropping in on classes and talking to people um, you know in different places as much as we can just going to get a good picture because uh, even though I live here all the time you always need to re-engage with your concepts of the place that you live and then Landon and, and Richard are from outside the community so they have a really interesting perspective too because they, they came in thinking like Sabri's A, B and C I've got it all figured out and then after being here a week you kind of realize that it's not easy to pin down a community mm-hmm. on stereotype alone no certainly not it's not all big nickels and maple syrup <laughs> uh, although maple syrup is delicious <laughs> it is and especially in uh, a canoe in a canoe if, yeah you've never, you've never drank an entire canoe full of maple syrup that's like the Sudbury ritual. You haven't heard of this? No. And you have to do it in the glow of slag being poured. Wow. Yeah. I've been need, doing it wrong. You need stars to align. Like it's a very difficult process, but that's wow. you'll be initiated and made an official Sudburyan if you can. Wow. Do that. Okay. Well, I'll get working on that this summer. Yeah. <laughs> summer plans. <laughs> Oh man. Okay, so we're gonna move into our last, or one of our one of our segments here. This is our creator conversations questions. So these are a few standard questions that I ask our guests uh, pertaining to our community. So it's a good chance for you to just show from the rooftops what you love about the area. Oh man. Um, so there's obviously a famous stereotype of writers writing in Starbucks, um, <laughs> and since we have. Not very many Starbucks. What is what is your version of Starbucks? Where where do you like to go to to get some writing done? I mostly work in my my attic, so I have a <laughs> like I, the solitude. I, I like the solitude of well, except the solitude that I live in is cats trying to climb on top of me at all times. But I, I primarily I, I did go through the years of the coffee shop haunting. I primarily try to work out of my home office right now. But when I do go downtown. I, yeah, co- I love coffee shops. I love to work in them. You know, I find that it's it gets you out of your head. You know, it gets you back working with people. So I mean, I don't I really have one that I go to. I kind of spread myself. Old Rock has always sort of been because they've been here the longest. That I end up usually is that that central place I go to. But I love these new ones like Cup of Joe and Salute. It's nice to see new coffee shops downtown, and I've worked in all of them. 
and will continue to. You are just not discerning. <laughs> no, it's. I mean, it's. It's nice sometimes to see people you know, and so you go to those places where you know you're going to be able to have a conversation. Other days you want the anonymity of a back corner. Mm. So yeah, absolutely. All right, so we have lots of great theater companies. We've got like STC, we've got Yes Theater, we've got um, the TNO, TNO, we've got Theater Cambrian, uh, at one point Encore. Um, so is there any a favorite production that you've ever caught on a Sudbury stage that you can think of? Yeah, I think sometimes when you're in it, uh, I don't know if, if you can empathize with this, but sometimes when something is your job that you're doing all the time, that you lose a bit of the joy when when you're an observer when you're doing it. Like it's almost like you're so used to doing the thing that it's hard to just sort of, you know, if you're, if you're a driver all the time and all of a sudden somebody says sit in the back seat, it's really difficult to sometimes just be on the road, right? So it's tough. I think a lot of the time I don't go to the theater in a state where I can just be in that joyful place. And so it takes, I think, sometimes a production, a particular production that punches you in the face and gets you out of whatever sort of um, malaise my brain is in. And it doesn't happen that often, but I do have a really specific memory. I'll tell you two. One is my earliest theater experience um, I remember seeing Bye Bye Birdie at Sudbury Secondary School, which isn't a great musical. It's not, you know, it's it's an old timey sort of musical. But I remember having a moment as like a 13 year old of realizing in the middle of the show that I would never see this group of people do this show again. And it's when it clicked for me that theater is so ephemeral that it's there for a moment and gone. I mean, it's a bad example. But a more recent example would be I think a lot of the time some of the most exciting theater I see in town happens at the TNO because they're bringing in uh, shows from all over Quebec um, really like exciting visceral uh, image based theater not traditional English language theater that we're used to and I actually saw a, a production there called Yellow Moon which is a, a translation of a Scottish player David Gregg's piece and it was it just blew me away it was a really um, beautifully simple uh, production and although I don't speak French, luckily they had those surtitles there. There was a rhythm and a music to the text that was so apparent that uh, really blew me away. And that was one of those rare times I got woken up in the theater and, and remembered like this is why I'm doing it is to try to create this experience, this electricity that that production clearly had. Wow, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And it happens really, but I mean, that's a good thing. I think that it doesn't happen all the time because you should be electrocuted all the time. No, I like... Just once in a while. Lightning can only strike so many times, right? And like, yeah. if there wasn't, weren't these amazing productions, you wouldn't really have anything to strive for, you know? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have anything to set it against, I guess. All right, so we're moving to our last segment. So this is called our Hot Jam Sandwich. Ooh. It's a good one. Um, I prefer peanut butter and honey, but you know... Well, you know... <laughs> Not today. No, not today. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, this is your chance to play DJ a little bit. So you give me um, one or two song requests, and I am going to play them right after your interview. So do you have any requests for us? Oh, man, I'm not allowed to think about this. This is like on the pressure sort of thing. Uh, play me anything by Shaky Stars. Uh, Whoa, okay. Because it's Mark, and Mark is amazing, and I love his band. There's some local music that um, has just continues to grow on me every time I listen to that album. It just gets in your ear. All right. Did I buy myself enough time? You said two. It's got to be two. Um, can I? Well, I don't know. Can I ask for a weird one? Can you play the Littlest Hobo theme? <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll play the Littlest Terry Bush. Hobo I want to hear Terry Bush's um, Tomorrow. <laughs> Is that the? I don't even know the name of the song. The Littlest Hobo. Yeah, theme. I definitely. I, I. Everyone knows what song you're talking about. Okay. That's, I don't know why. I just felt like it. I feel, I feel wistful today. I need. To, I need wow. to think about a German Shepherd running down a road. You know, I think. I need to think about that every day. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> it's maybe tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. maybe tomorrow. Yeah. Da, 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 oh, so you can da, da. sing it. We don't need to play it. <laughs> I might cut that part out. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, off the top of my head, because I get stumped on this question every week, even though I'm asking it myself, um, I'm going to choose a song from OK Go. 
They're one of my favorite bands. I haven't listened oh, to yeah. them in a little while. It's a good one. Um, and you should go check out all their music videos because also, if you're listening right now and you happen to be a teacher, um, if you go, if you look it up, I, I can't remember the web address exactly right now, but uh, if you've watched any of their music videos, they do lots of really crazy, cool concept videos and they've actually created a curriculum to go along with their music videos. What? To, really? To basically explain the math and science behind the videos. Oh, that's great. So if you happen to be listening and you're a teacher looking for some really cool co- content for your class, look that up. <laughs> that's cool. Uh, so we're going to cut to our the last of our music and we'll uh, then we'll be wrapping up our show for the night. So uh, re- make sure you check out Play Smelter coming up at the end of April and also keep an eye out uh, next year for Yes Theater's 10th anniversary season where we should be seeing the final project, uh, product of the Roundup project. Hey, welcome back to CKLU. That was the end of our interview this hour with Matt Haiti. Uh, so we talked to him all this hour about uh, Project Canada, uh, Project Bookmark Canada, uh, that'll be installing a plaque on May 3rd at the Townhouse Tavern. Um, that's to mark the nickel bin, uh, as it's named in his book, The City Still Breathing, as uh, essentially a literary landmark. It's uh, the 20th landmark that they have installed a plaque at, a plaque at and it's also the first in the north. Uh, so pretty exciting opportunity. Um, like Matt says, he's he's a he's a he doesn't want to take a, too much attention away from other people. Um, he feels that he's just kind of a representation of the North. But you've done the hard work, and uh, we thank you for it. So we're gonna go into our last segment of music here. So we had some requests from Matt. Uh, I think we might only be able to. I think we're only gonna be able to play one, but uh, we're gonna play Circuit from Shaky Stars, which very coincidentally, if you tune into our next show. Six Degrees, uh, he'll actually, uh, Steve will be interviewing uh, Mark from Shaky Stars, so definitely keep tuned in. Uh, if you want to listen to this episode again, or if you want to listen to any of our past episodes, uh, you can always check out ourcreator.com. We will post all our episodes afterwards. Uh, you can also check out there for updates all throughout the week about different things that are happening around Sudbury, uh, so you can really make it your home and get involved in the crater. Uh, so we're going to play that tune from Shaky Stars. We'll be back in just want to sign off. Thanks for tuning in to Creator Conversations presented by Our Creator. We can't play the music right here, but check out below for the link to this week's playlist, as well as all the links you need for this week's guest. Make sure you're subscribed to Our Creator on all your feeds. Look us up on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under Our Creator, and use the hashtag Our Creator to be featured. All right, that's it for me this hour. We are uh, signing off from Creator Conversations this week. Uh, so stay tuned to CKLU in just a moment. The song we just played was Circuit from Shaky Stars. And uh, rumor has it that actually the next show, Nick Six Degrees Steve, will be actually interviewing one of the members of the band. So stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll catch you again next Tuesday.